And yeah, there's the front, uh, the front page of this lecture. I spent quite a bit of time uh, doing thermal barometry in pyrex and geotherms. Um, and it's given me some insight into what's going on in the, in the lithosphere and in particular, um, how do we approach the ADI bat at the bottom of the lithosphere? So we'll see a lot of these kind of diagrams uh, in this talk. But again, I want to pay a tribute to, to other people that have gone before, in particular, Joe Boyd, 1973. Uh, this is a barometer, weight percent aluminum in orthopyroxene coexisting with garnet. Um, uh, these over here, Boyd and Nixon, uh, same journal, uh, geochemical, Geochemica Cosmochemica Acta, uh, 1978. This is the pyroxene solvus. Um, there's clinopyroxene compositions, there's orthopyroxene compositions, and these are temperatures uh, related to the clinopyroxene compositions. So we'll see a lot of that kind of stuff um, um, in, this, in this lecture. Again, this is quite a complex lecture, things get quite technical, but I hope I can get the message across. So let's start. Um, this is what I try to cover. Um, it's a, again, it's quite a big topic, but it will go quite fast. Um, we'll start by looking at traditional mantle zenoliths thermal barometry, the impact of elevated geotherms. We'll look at errors in precision. And then we go to these new age single grain techniques. We'll spend a lot of time talking about single clinopyroxene thermal barometry in geotherms. We'll touch on orthopyroxene variant of that. We'll talk about mantle plumes a little bit, and then we'll go through two applications and also manganese and pyrothermometry. So there's a good question to ask. Why do we bother with pressure temperature determinations? If we can take a diagram like this, a calcium diagram, um, and we can identify G10 garnets and their association with diamond, why do we bother with pressure temperatures? Uh, we bother because of a paper that was published by uh, uh, Simon Shi and uh, uh, John Bristow and other people in 1986, where they described mantle zenoliths from the Kuruman province in Kimberley, in, in, uh, uh, just you know, northwest of Kimberley, uh, in which they, they put out subcalcic garnet compositions in, zero, in, in, in Hartsburgite zenoliths from the Kuruman Kimberlite province, which when you calculate the pressure temperature com uh, uh, conditions for those subcalcic, um, um, those zenoliths, you find out that the zenoliths are on a geotherm like this, but they all plot inside the graphite stability field. So that puts a, a, um, a, a cat amongst the pigeons which is called a hot geotherm. If you end up with these type of garnet compositions and they're sitting in the graphite stability field, then they obviously cannot have a diamond association. And so since 1986, this whole question of is my G10 garnet, or for that matter, a G9 garnet, is it in the graphite stability field or is it in the diamond stability field is a topic of conversation. And that topic of conversation uh, occurs within a framework that has three important principles to consider. The one is this line up here, which is called the mantle ADI bat. It's, uh, it's characteristic of convection in the asthenosphere. If you bring that convection to surface, it will intersect at zero kilobars at about 1330 degrees centigrade. As you go to depth, um, it increases very, very, uh, in a very small amount. So it's almost a vertical line uh, on this pressure temperature diagram. Intersecting the mantle A diabat at various depths or pressures, are these lines that are called lithospheric geotherms. They are characteristic of conduction, which is the heat transfer mechanism in the lithosphere. And they're measured in heat flow units uh, at the surface of the earth. 
And those heat flow units are expressed in milliwatts per meter squared, 50, 45, 40, 35. So this is a hot geotherm over here. And then as we go downwards, those geotherms get cooler. As you go to a cooler geotherm, you pass through these lines over here, which are rec recognized as the graphite diamond stability field. Um, so a 40 milliwatt geotherm over here intersects graphite diamond roughly at about 1,000 degrees centigrade over here, 900 to 1,000. So if you're on a hot geotherm, 42 milliwatts per, milli, uh, uh, per meter squared, you're in the graphite stability field right up into the adiabat. Whereas if you're on a cooler geotherm, you intersect the diamond stability field, and that's fundamental. I've shown two different uh, diamond stability fields. The one is Ke uh, Kennedy and Kennedy, 1976, in a solid line that's been used extensively ever since it was uh, formulated in 76. But of late, we've seen uh, other versions of the, the diamond stability field appear, in particular, uh, in 2012 by day, that's uh, shown by a, a dashed line. It actually does make a, a, a quite a difference to which one you, you choose to use. Um, and there are others that have also appeared uh, more recently, but you'll see Kennedy and Kennedy was the only one used earlier on. Um, and I show that just for comparative purposes in the rest of the talk. If we look at, um, uh, these experiments that are, that are phase petrology experiments that are done to calibrate uh, barometers. Here's a bunch of barometers over there, or thermometers over here. You need to know what their precision is or the reproduction or the experimental pressures. Um, just don't worry about all the details. Just notice the range, the plus or minus two to three and a half kilobars uh, at one sigma for the barometers, it's not that accurate. Um, and the thermometers, uh, the pyroxene thermometers are, are quite good, plus or minus 15 to plus or minus 30 degrees centigrade, uh, one sigma. The iron magnesium exchange thermometers are not that good. And in fact, in natural application, they're a lot worse. Um, but just bear that in mind. I want to point out something here that the CPX barometer and the CPX thermometer that I'll be talking about a lot has some of the better precisions in the experimental calibrations than some of the other things that are available to us. And that has important consequences. If you wanna start comparing temperatures between different systems, it gets really complicated very quickly. Um, in particular, when you start applying it to mantle zenolith data, as opposed to calibration experiments, because this is an uncontrolled experiment. Mantle zenolith data are not controlled. You get what you get. But I've teamed up with a guy called Paolo Nimus, who's done a lot of work. And in 2010, we tackled this problem. We found out that um, here's a clinopyroxene temperature over here, and we're comparing it against an orthopyroxene garnet temperature, there's some systematic differences for different zenith data sets. Um, for our application in terms of this talk, don't worry about it, largely because graphite diamond is in the range 900 to 1000 degrees centigrade. And in that range, the temperature differences between these different uh, th uh, thermometers up there is actually quite small. You have to start worrying about systematic differences if you go to lower temperatures or to higher temperatures. There are now a whole bunch of what I call new age single grain pressure temperature techniques. I'm not going to go through them in any detail. Uh, some of them are not as new age anymore. They uh, date back to 96 or 99. Um, and it's a work in progress. The latest um, uh, delivery was in 2017. Um, and there are, there are new versions coming out. There's, you know, there's a discussion in 2021. So this is a long ranging story about what to use where. The point I'm trying to make here is this. It's pretty easy to get a temperature. And you can get it for a range of different minerals. Gone, it's chromites, gone, it's chrome oxides, olivines, olivines. 
But there's only one mineral that you can use to get both pressure and temperature at once. If you analyze only one mineral, it's chrome dioxide. And for the rest of this talk, you will hear a lot about this thermobarometry technique. If you do pyroxene thermobarometry on Carpval and Gibeon Zinlis, that's a uh, this time period, on the left, using classical thermobarometry, where you use a xenolith and you have an orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene, and garnet composition analyzed from that xenolith, you get geotherms from xenolith that look like this. For Gibeon, there's a slightly elevated geotherm or a thermal perturbation over there. That's in Namibia, Xenolith from Namibia. Northern Lesotho in green has a characteristic um, uh, a geotherm profile, roughly 40 milliwatts, goes into diamond stability field about 1,000 degrees centigrade, but has a very unique signal of higher temperatures that are above the adiabat. Remember that. In Kimberley, lots of xenoliths from Kimberley. You see the blue line over here, very straight, very clear conductive geotherm, just below 40 milliwatts, uh, with an error of 40 milliwatts. So that's the picture you get on the left if you use traditional xenolith thermobarometry. If you now take this clinopyroxene from that data set and you apply the single grain thermobarometer to that clinopyroxene composition, you get this picture on the right hand side. Notice there's a consistent overall topology between these two these, the red, the green, and the blue are in the same relative orientation. The CPX PT, PT arrays appear flatter. In other words, they, they cross over the conductive geotherms. That's a function of the barometer. Um, but you see the same relative uh, arrangement uh, for the carb vol. It looks like you've got one conductive geotherm over there. You can see one conductive geotherm for the clinopyroxenes using the single CPX technique. The diamond window is in the same place. You can reproduce the C super adiabatic temperatures from northern Lesotho uh, using the single grain approach. So if you look at the calibration or the, the, the relative information recovery that you get from the single CPX thermobarometry technique by assuming the presence of coexisting orthopyroxene and garnet, you can do pretty well. So I played the same game in Canada. And again, you can see basically the same, the same uh, situation. The overall topology, red versus green versus blue, is the same on the left-hand side as it is on the right-hand side. There are no temperatures above the adiabat. You reproduce that on the left to the right. Um, the big difference between the Canadian data set and the Southern African data set is that you separate three distinct geotherms. There's a geotherm over there comes from Somerset Island. Uh, it stays in the graphite stability field for most of, its, uh, most of its life. And it turns out there are very few diamonds recovered from Somerset Island. And most of the Kimberlites do, you know, do not have diamonds in them. There are one or two that do. But it's very, very low grade diamond contents. At Kirkland Lake, uh, you see a different geotherm over there. It's slightly cooler in green. You see that on the left-hand side as well. The Kirkland Lake Kimberlites, most of them are diamondiferous, uh, uh, but they are lower grades and they are not mined. And then if you go to the Slave Craton, the central and northern Slave Craton, you see this type of geotherm over there. It enters the diamond stability field over there, very low temperatures, and then has a sort of a strange arrangement to sort of slightly higher conductive geotherms. That's a 36 milliwatt geotherm there. If you compare it between there and there, and then it ends up closer to a 40 milliwatt geotherm. That's a very strange feature of what's going on on the slave. Nevertheless, uh, it's clearly different in terms of um, its errors or its envelope uh, from 
the curtain light geotherm. And so we have three distinct geotherms to calibrate ourselves against when we're using the single clinopyroxene thermobarometry technique. That then has um, a, a, a side benefit. If you use the orthopyroxene compositions from these same zinglers, you map out three geotherms in orthopyroxene space, where you assume garnet and clinopyroxene coexisting, then the aluminum content of the orthopyroxene is a barometer, the calcium content of the orthopyroxene is a thermometer, and there you have a hot geotherm, a, a intermediate geotherm, and a cold geotherm mapped out in orthopyroxene space. Thank you very much. Cheap and easy way of determining um, where you are relative to graphite diamond and this very important curve called the mental ADR layer. Turns out this diagram is consistent uh, with high pressure experiments that were done in 2008. And you will find all of this stuff written up in this paper over here. So, We've generated ourselves a, a framework for pyroxene thermobarometry using single mineral grains, which just immensely increases the amount of data that we can consider because it's much easier to recover single grains from everywhere. And here's some examples of application just on the orthopyroxene side. These are orthopyroxenes that were recovered from till samples in the Northern Slave. Guess what? It matches the Northern Slave geotherm that we get out of Zinglas. Um, these are all the pyroxenes that were recovered in till samples in the Kirkland Lake area uh, and the Tomiskaming uh, Kimberlite fields. Guess what? We match the, uh, the underlying Zinglas geotherm. Um, but in addition, we see some um, uh, other compositions here, high aluminum orthopyroxene compositions. Those ones come out of spinel bearing pyrolithites. And because the garnet does not coexist with the spinel, uh, the orthopyroxene composition changes um, and it does not indicate pressure anymore. And so you, you, you separate out these compositions in terms of their applicability to geotherms. You have to have garnet coexisting with orthopyroxene to constrain pressure. Um, and you can see that on this diagram over there. And that's the last time I will talk about orthopyroxene geotherms for a while. From now on, we will be talking about clinopyroxene geotherms. Oh, no, I, I do have one more application. Uh, the coldest geotherms that we know of actually come, uh, are based on orthopyroxene on the left, clinopyroxene on the right, from uh, two localities, Argyll. Over there, we can see there's a, uh, there's a hot, hottish geotherm in the, inside the diamond stability field over there on both sides of this diagram. And for Gacho Quay, which is in, uh, in Canada, it's an operating mine. That's the coldest geotherm that we, have, that we know of. Look at these data over here on clinopyroxene and those data over there on orthopyroxene. Again, we can see that these phases are in equilibrium with each other and they give us the same part of a story uh, on these diagrams that we now have available to us. Um, a huge leap forward in terms of thermobarometry. It's a well calibrated systems and the mantle is behaving as it should. I want to point out there are no temperatures at Argyle that are above the Argyle. The only thing that um, that I have to point out here, you can see these geo conductive geotherms are curved, and that's because they come out of a previous reference, 1977, uh, that has a legacy history. It's, uh, it's, it's everywhere in the, uh, um, in the literature. In the gray box on the right here, I just put up this little comment, mantle plumes are 200 degrees centigrade hotter than the ADAR bat. So there's the ADAR bat. Mantle plumes are that way. Temperatures recorded at depth are in general less than adiabatic, as you can see on this diagram. So plumes are in general not directly involved in kimberlite or lamprite genesis. 
Um, there are two exceptions at depth in northern Lesotho and in Coromandel. We rarely record temperatures that are about 80 degrees centigrade hotter than the Adar Bat. And so for that reason, we're going to go and have a look at what's going on in Coromandel right now. This is a paper that I published uh, in 2004 together with George Reed and a number of other people who worked in the field. Um, it's a very interesting setting uh, in, in um, Minas Gerais State in Brazil. And if I had to change the title of this talk, it would be changed to this new title over there um, that has a lot more sort of impact in terms of the talk that I would give, that I'm going to give you right now. We start here with a stratigraphic section. At the bottom, there are platform sediments. They are uh, not platform, they are they're, uh, they're basement sediments, upper Proterozoic and mid Proterozoic. Uh, that's overlain by a Cretaceous succession um, in which this part of the early Cretaceous hosts kimberlites that have diamonds in them. And then there's an unconformity. And above the unconformity in the late Cretaceous, there is um, a alkaline potassic uh, extrusive magmatic event, uh, huge, huge impact. Uh, at the base of that, uh, that succes succession, um, there's a volcanic clastic member called the Mashisi member, and it's stuffed with garnet and kleiner pyroxene uh, right at the base. We'll see that in a moment. So just remember that. Kimberlites with diamonds, uh, alkaline volcanic clastics a bit younger. None of these alkaline volcanic clastics have ever been found to contain diamond. If you do clinopyroxene thermal barometry for samples that come from these kimberlites, in this paper we describe 905 of those clinopyroxene from seven localities. 35% of the data are from spinel lerzolite clinopyroxenes, 65% from garnet lerzolite. You'll see here, there's a 12 kilobar pressure range at a fixed temperature. Look at the temperature pressure range over there. That's quite different from the plus or minus 2.3 that I indicated as a precision earlier on. And the reason we're getting 12 kilobars is because we're not measuring one sigma anymore. Now we're measuring three sigma uh, because these are real data. Um, and so that gives you an idea of the types of errors that you need to be, need to be prepared for if you do thermobarometry on real rocks and you're not doing them in controlled circumstances in phase equilibrium experiments. Nevertheless, we can constrain an average 37 milliwatt geotherm. It goes into a diamond window at uh, 880 degrees centigrade. Let's look at that. There's from that point over there upwards over there, there's 880, and the sources contain diamonds. So these kimberlites contain diamonds. That's great. The kimberlites are dated at 95 to 89 million years. If we play the same game, and we sample this, uh, this member, the Mashishi member, we take the clinopyroxenes out of the Mashishi member, we use the same thermobarometry technique from the basal breccia, of the matter decoder, uh, 1,400 CPX from 22 localities, uh, split of spinel to garnet lerzolite. The average temperature at a given pressure is 230 degrees centigrade hotter. You'll see that in a different way. Uh, and this happened in 4 million years. All of a sudden, your thermobarometers are telling you there's a huge thermal influx and it happened snap in 4 million years. The diamond window is situated at larger than 12, 40 degrees centigrade, and not many of these dinoparoxines have those temperatures. And so basically, the, your diamond root has disappeared. There are diamonds that are at the unconformity. Uh, this is what this picture is all about. People are actually mining this member because they're going after the basal contact over here, where we believe the diamonds that are sitting on this basal contact over here come out of these kimberlites, and they do not come out of this material over here. 
Then you can sample these, uh, these, uh, these alkaline volcanic plastics themselves, and we did 508, 508 CPX from 10 localities. Most of these come from spinel lozolites. Uh, they're 2% of the data. That's these couple of data points that come from garnet lozolite CPX. We argue that they are derived as rip up clasts from this member that are included in the matter de Corda volcanics. Um, and there are no known diamonds from this matter de Corda volcanics. They've been dated at 84 to 61 million years. So essentially, boom, you've lost your whole garnet bearing a uh, root below the craton and it happened in 10 million years. For those of you who are not familiar with the term Kamafugai, it's an acronym, acronym for Katungai, Maphorite, Ugandite, after the alkaline mafic volcanics uh, in Angola, uh, sorry, in Uganda, in the African Rift Valley. And that's quite a useful coincidence because the setting that we associate with these matter de Corda volcanics at this time, 84 to 61 million years, is basically a failed rift settings. These matter de Corda volcanics occur in half gravens, and they are also associated with carbonatites, just like the case for camafrugites in Uganda, in the African rift area. That's Peter Williamson. He took me on a field trip. He's standing right on the contact between um, uh, the, the, uh, these uh, early Cretaceous uh, um, uh, rocks and the matter de Corda basal uh, volcanic clastic member. And these people are mining diamonds uh, from this material because they are after the diamonds that are sitting on this unconformity, which we believe come from the Kimberlites because of this geothermal evidence. There's a different way of looking at the same data. Uh, over the time period. This is a histogram of temperatures, and it shows this. The P50 for spinel pyruvatite CPX is 752 degrees centigrade. It didn't change with time, quite important. The P50 at uh, 90, 95 to 89 million years in the Kimberlites is 821. In the Mashishi member, it's uh, 1051, there's 230 degrees centigrade difference. Uh, it happened in 4 million years. And by the time 84 million years came around, your garnet root was gone. How do you destroy? Oh, I have to make this point. Notice that over here, there's a small signal that's coming from larger than 1350 degrees centigrade. It's present at this time and at this time. And it's very well resolved because the one sigma error of this thermometer is 15 degrees centigrade uh, at those temperatures. It's a bit larger at lower temperatures, but at high temperatures, it's very well resolved. And so there's a story that goes with that. Essentially, early on, you have a cold geotherm. It stopped at 53 kilobar pressure inside the diamond stability field. There's graphite diamond over there. Uh, a bit later on, there was sharp heating by 230 degrees centigrade um, um, at the base of and within 53 kilovolt of the sphere. In other words, if you take these solid uh, squares and you put geotherms around them, one end member would be a geotherm that looks like this. It's been heated at its base. It's hot at the bottom there. The other is a geotherm that would look like that. That's that geotherm over there. This geotherm reflects internal heating. It's not heated from below, it's been heated from inside. And it ends up at the same point against the adiabat where you can see temperatures that are above the adiabat. What this means is there's a plume that's involved and it's been involved in heating from below and putting heat in input inside the lithospheric section by way of, 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 of imparting magnetic activity. Um, and then a little bit later, the whole lithosphere collapses in a rift-like setting, and your geotherm looks like a rift-like setting inside the spinel like a stability field. So we end up with a failed rift 
of thermally weakened lithosphere, it's an extensional setting, um, and flood gamma Fugard magnetism. We would not have known this if we were not able to do Kleiner pyroxene thermobarometry on single grains. So that's one uh, fairly spectacular example of how we can apply that particular thermobarometer and why it matters in diamond exploration because these things, the kimberlites, clearly have diamond potential. They have sampled material inside the diamond stability field. Whereas the Mashishi volcanic, the Mashishi member and the volcanic plastics thereafter do not notice how quickly these conditions have changed in time. 10 million years is all it takes if a plume happens to impact the base of your lithospheric section. I'm going to look uh, at a slightly different uh, application, Northern Ontario. Canada is a big place. There are lots of Kimberlite provinces. I've selected these, this province over here for the reason it contains two distinct Kimberlite um, uh, eruptive periods. The Kai Lake Kimberlites, were erupted roughly 1100 million years ago. There are four or five of those. And De Beers' Ariwapiskat uh, uh, Kimberlite field, where they mined the Victor Kimberlite, erupted at 180 million years. These are 100 kilometers apart and in the middle of the superior craton. There's the superior craton over there. So we've got two Kimberlite events very close to each other inside a craton at different times. Question is, are the geotherms different? What is the story in terms of diamond potential? Um, so I've used the Kleiner Pyrex. Oh, there's an important point to make. Uh, these Kylite Kimberlites erupted at the same time as the 1100 million year mid-continental rift, which is 600 kilometers further to the south on this diagram over here. It's basically over there. If we take the Kleiner pyroxene thermobarometry approach to data from uh, Kai Lake Kimberlites, they're on open file. Um, then the black data points is where your results lie relative to the framework that we now have from Canadian, the Canadian setting. Uh, we see a slightly elevated geotherm. It enters the diamond stability field uh, at a high temperature. Uh, notice all these Kleiner pyroxene temperatures are lower than the a diver. To put that into context, um, at a younger time for the Adewa-Piscat Kimberlite fields from the same open file data set, there's the Kleiner pyroxene geotherm that we see at a younger time. It goes into the diamond stability field. Um, the geotherm is cooler. It's gray over here. You can see that it's reproduced over there. It's, it's marginally cooler. Uh, but it makes a big difference in terms of the intersection with the diamond window. The diamond window is a temperature of 1000 degrees centigrade as opposed to 1225 over here. So we see with time the changing in geotherm. In this case, it's a very slow cooling from 1100 million years over there to 180 million years over there. Um, 75 to 125 degrees cooling, depending on where you are on the geotherm. How do we put that into, um, into further context? Uh, I just, I'm gonna go jump ahead. Because we have studied diamonds from the Victor mine, which is over there, we know that there was new diamond growth at about 720 million years. And so there has been 500 million years of slow cooling after the 1100 million uh, mid-continent rift event. Um, and that's in gray because it's, you know, we didn't know that if we didn't mine those, uh, those diamonds at Victor and do diamond inclusion studies. In other words, we would have had to rely on this uh, single grain evidence that I'm showing you that's on open file to reconstruct um, this, this history. Um, I want to put a little bit further context uh, on, on these results by introducing manganese thermometry on garnets. Um, and that uh, provides a link back to the G10, G9 diagram that we discussed uh, in the previous lecture. 
So at the Kai Lake, these kimberlites over here, these are the garnet compositions that you find at Kai Lake. Um, and they look uh, pretty uh, alluring or, or, or of interest um, on the chrome calcium diagram. We now know there was a hot geotherm at the time that these kimberlites erupted. Uh, and so we need to put thermal context on these garnet compositions. To do so, I'm going to introduce a little projection. There's the G10, G9 divide. It has a calcium number down here of 3.375. Um, you can project things down chrome to values from 0 to 3.375, and you will be in the G10 field. And above 3.375, upwards to about 6, you will be in the G9 field. So that's what this projection is about. From 0 to 3.375 is in the G10 field. From 3.375 to about 6 is in the G9 field. There's that boundary. But I've now got on the y-axis inverted uh, from low temperature to high temperature. Uh, manganese temperatures calculated from these garnet compositions. And what we find is that most of these garnets are high temperature. They're above 1,000 degrees centigrade. And we know the diamond window starts at 1225. So right at the bottom of the section, we have G10 garnets that are sitting in the diamond stability field. And it turns out the Kai Lake kimberlites actually do have diamonds, even though the geotherm is slightly elevated. We have no garnet data for the low chrome eclogite component in this data set. Um, and here's an interesting factoid. The diamonds at Kai Lake coexisted with the 1100 million year old mid-continent rift event. Um, even though the geotherm was elevated, the rift is 600 kilometers to the south. Um, and these diamonds have survived, or they were entrained and brought to surface at the time of rifting 600 kilometers to the south. So these diamonds coexisted with that rift event. We can play the same game. Now, you know, watch the difference that you'll see in this next slide. Play the same game for Adela Piscat. I'll go back. Look at a completely different thermal profile that you get out of Adam Pusca. And also on the left-hand side, the different chrome calcium diagram. It's completely different. You cannot imagine the setting of a situation that is so different. Um, at Adam Pusca, we basically see no very few G10 garnets, um, and the mantle sampling is exclusively at lower temperatures. If we had to go around and um, assess the proportion of G10 garnets that are in the diamond, stabi diamond stability field at a, above 1,000 degrees centigrade, we'd be looking at this little window over here. And so the, the conclusion here is, or the discussion here is at 180 million years, the Ariwapiskat kimberlites are dominantly sampling of graphite facies material of lurzolitic mantle. In other words, G9s at temperatures below a thousand. That's the dominant signal that you'll get out of, uh, out of these uh, kimberlites over there. There is almost no G10 garnet data that fall in the diamond window. Uh, low chrome eclogite garnets are present, there they are up there. Um, and we either have to infer diamonds that Adam Piscat survived the 1100 million year old MCR event or they grew afterwards during the lithospheric cooling. It turns out the latter is the case. And um, these are the diamond inclusions that you see at Victor. They're very unusual. They are dominantly G9. There are some eclogitic and there are some wordetic uh, diamond inclusions, in fact. That's very, very unusual to get this. So the diamond growth event that happened in the superior craton after the mid-continent rift event uh, introduced a new wave of diamond mineralization in rock types that ordinarily we do not associate with diamonds. 
the diamond window has shifted at the same temperatures from uh, G10 compositions to G9 compositions and uniquely uh, generated the conditions that are suitable for mining. And so this is a completely new paradigm in terms of diamond exploration. How do we deal with G9 associated diamonds? Um, I can tell you uh, thermal barometry is going to be part of that picture. If you want to read more about this very unusual setting, this is a key paper to read. Uh, it's in mineralogy and petrology. Um, and I think that's the last bit of this talk. Here are the conclusions. Geothermes vary as a function of lithosphere scale geodynamics, heat flow and time. The geothermal relationship we witness to the waning and waxing of lithospheric diamond reservoirs in time and in space. Um, we wouldn't know about all of the stuff going on in the deep lithosphere if we did not have access to these new age single grain thermal barometry techniques. They have matured and they can be usefully applied based on the following principles. You need quality electron microprobe data for pyrolytic CPX, OPX, and gone. And guess what? We have lots of that. I've shown you there's stuff on open file that you can use. There is no constraint in terms of applying these new age techniques um, based on the data availability. You need to sense check what you do against traditional mantle zima thermal barometry. I've shown how you can do that. It's published. You need to sense check against the presence of diamonds or not. That's a key learning that comes from you know, having John Gurney around for so many years. John tells you, if you cannot account for your story in terms of the diamond content of your sources, then you're simply speculating. So do that sense check all the time. Keep an eye on your errors and precision. And these are all the applications that I covered in this, uh, in this lecture. I hope I did the topic justice. Thank you very much, Herman. Questions? Just, just a comment on Victor. I mean, my, my recall on it that the diamonds were, were really nice diamonds and they were look like $450, $500 goods. Um, the grade was pretty low, as I recall. So it wasn't Indeed. sort of a dripping roast. No? Indeed. No, the diamonds were good. Yeah. The diamonds were, and, um, yeah. That was a, a very unusual example, but I chose to, to, to use that example because we had these two ages of, of, of kimberlite magmatism 100 kilometers apart. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and it shows a whole lot of other things, you know. I could have chosen the state old slave stuff um, and so on, but it's not illustrative of, of the techniques that are available to us today. No, no I agree. And, and the sort of wherelytic um, perigenesis, and obviously, you know, it extends on Herb, on Herb Helmstead's talk too, that these cratons are complex beasts and you've also got to understand their, you know, their geology and structure, Herman. Yeah, uh, these are evolving geodynamic systems. Mm. And, and it's, it's in a geodynamic uh, framework that we can understand them. If we, if we think of cratons as static beasts, we are going down the wrong track. These Absolutely. are dynamic, these are dynamic uh, environments. Mm. Yeah. Well, next next time you come visit Cape Town and the family, best we talk about you know the next layers of work on the carp file. There's lots for you to do back here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And 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 I mean the other fascinating thing is is the point that you made. So much of this data is on open file, Herman, which is fantastic. Yeah, look, it's I mean the days have changed, right? Where the diamond industry was closed and secretive. Yeah. Why are there any diamonds at all at Somerset? Yeah, that's a very good question, um, uh, Jay Rain. It's one that I've been battling with, um, and so I have an answer for you. So what um, what uh, Jay Rain is asking is, look, if if we've got here's the diagram that he's referring to. Um, 
This is CPX pressures and temperatures in red for Somerset Island, and all of it um, is falling in the graphite stability field. Um, and if you look at the orthopyroxene diagram on the left-hand side here, same story over there, I've put graphite diamond over here, and all of these data uh, fall straight, straight in the graphite stability field. Now, this is a question of which diamond stability field is actually real. The diamond stability field that I've calibrated on through my career, because it's the one that, um, that is, uh, is, was most widely used, was Kennedy and Kennedy in 1976. This is this black solid line over here. And it's the same black solid line that I've interpreted on the OPX diagram over here. That's the Kennedy and Kennedy graphite diamond stability field. Um, and you can see it lies on the outer edge of this green data array over here. So I've interpreted it on the outer edge of the green data array over there. However, if you start reading the literature and it's the more recent literature, uh, there is this other diamond stability field called the day 2012 diamond stability field. And there are a number of other diamond stability fields that are in the thermodynamic data sets, which put graphite diamond actually quite shallower over there. So I have not mapped this diamond stability field into the orthopyrotes in space. If I had to map it in, it would go sort of somewhere down the middle of this green data array, somewhere in there. Um, but it's getting closer and closer to having some of these um, um, uh, some of these data points sort of plotting in, in, in the diamond stability field. The fact is this, the John Gurney sense check is always, does your result make sense? And the question that you're asking is, why doesn't it make sense that these data don't end up more often inside the diamond stability field if we observe Navashni. if we observe some diamonds in some of the cumulites and, and I think the answer lies in in this there may be different ages of kimberlite at Somerset Island and some of those kimberlites may have a colder geothermal and they're not represented on this diagram these data come from um, a very particular set of kimberlites on Somerset Island. If you go across the strait, um, let me go down to the map over here. There's Somerset Island over there. If you go across the strait to number two over there, there's there are kimberlites that are similar age to the Somerset Island kimberlites, but they have a colder geotherm and people have actually gone in there and bulk sampled some of them because they have more diamonds. I suspect that there are kimberlites on Somerset Island that have a slightly colder geotherm that have just managed to touch into the diamond stability field. And those are the ones that have diamonds in them. But that's a problem that I have not yet resolved. But thank you for asking the question. It's a very observant one. And Herman, just, just all this data, is it out of um, Xenocris in, it, from the kimberlites themselves, or is it also from heavy mineral sampling? So um, these open files that are available in Canada have both. Mm -hmm. um, for, um, for this data set, uh, the Northern Ontario data set, which covers both, both Kyle Lake and, and, and Atawapiskat, um, that's from kimberlite sampling itself. Yeah, but because I guess the one advantage of your Canadian cold or the, you know, the sort of glacial setting is that um, you're, and, and the fact that, you know, the, the glaciers scraped off and gave you a nice clean surface on the top of the kimberlites does help compared to, you know, the deeper weathering profiles of many of the kimberlites, for example, in Africa, Southern Africa. Yeah, look, there's, um, so... I mean, there's been an, ex because we're so cold and we preserve particularly orthopyroxene and olivine. Olivine, there's, yeah. Yeah, there's been an explosion in, in the amount of knowledge that you get from olivines. Mm. 
Mm. Great. Okay. All right. Um, students, I guess you've got a lot to think about, and it's been a, um, a pretty um, brain stretching day. But any, any questions, comments? And, and thanks, Herman. And I see Urban's already made the point. Um, you know, your presentations and clarity and diagrams have been fantastic. And, and I guess credit to everyone today to, you know, the, the presentation standard has been fantastic. Yeah, John, I said uh, when I embarked on this exercise, uh, I yep. never do anything, you know, at half measure. When I embarked on this exercise, it would be a complete uh, redraft of stuff that was 12 years old, right? Um, 12 to 15 years old. It's time to update it and, and, and to present it to a new generation. No, well, having known you for a long time, I wouldn't have expected anything, anything, um, you know, otherwise than what you've done. So well done. And and your, I mean, your take. We asked the same question yesterday of Herb. I mean, your take. Um, and we've talked about this before. You know, is is Canada still prospective? Are we going to find more diamondiferous kimberlites, or are they going to be mostly small? Look, there are lots of diamond of risk kimberlites in Canada. I mean, it, yeah. it's like you made the point about the Kimberley map sheet, right? 17333. There were yeah. like 140, 140 kimberlites on the Kimberley map sheet. Um, um, I cut my teeth on, on that map sheet, you know, starting, starting on the 2nd of February, 1987. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, and basically the same applies to Canada. The, the, the difference really is, is, is getting things to an economic status in Canada is a, is a much higher threshold. Yeah. The costs to operate a mine in Canada are just insane. Um, in Africa, uh, right now, at Cal, those people are making money or sustaining themselves at, uh, at, a, at a low rate at, at roughly $15 a ton. You cannot even think of starting a mine in Canada now, unless you have about $85 a ton. Yeah, I was gonna say five times. It was always yeah. my, my rule of thumb. Yeah, yeah US. So, so look, there are, there are many Kimberlites in Canada that if they were in Africa, we would be, be mining, mining them. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not, the, the problem is not really the, you know, the, the, the side that we're engaged in with, which is the, sort of the early stage evaluation, there's lots of, um, there's lots of very interesting data and stuff to, to talk about in Canada from that perspective. The problem is bringing that to book from an economic uh, point of view. Yeah. And I mean, let's not mince any words here. There have been some spectacular failures in Canada on making things count from an economic point of view. Mm. And uh, <laughs> you know, people have been bitten um, and it's overcoming you know, that side of the industry, which has been, you know, there is a track record of failure. No, and um, it's an important point and I'm glad and you it's made It's a very it. important point that, yeah. that we have to, you know, we have to figure out there is some accountability that, that that rests on our shoulders for making sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah.